Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 74. Have you started using Python's assignment expressions in your code? Maybe you've heard of them called the walrus operator. Now that the controversy over the introduction in Python 3.8 has settled down, how can you use assignment expressions effectively in your code? This week on the show, David Amos is back, and he's brought another batch of PyCoder's weekly articles and projects. David shares a recent article by previous guest Brett Cannon about what to do if you botch a release to PyPI, the Python package index. It's a valuable resource to keep bookmarked for when things go sideways. We also talk about a recent project by Brett, a Python launcher for Unix-based operating systems. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a Python framework with a built-in database and authorization support from Replit. Do coders learn how to use entire libraries just from the documentation? How to use Sleep to code a Python uptime bot? Monitor your home's temperature and humidity with Raspberry Pis and Prometheus. And a fast settlers of Catan Python implementation with a strong AI player. This episode is brought to you by Gather, virtual offices for remote teams. Build a free office today at gather.town slash real Python. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. I uh, got this notice on YouTube from somebody saying that as many times as we've had you on the show, uh, that you should be called a co-host. And I agreed with that idea. <laughs> so I'm welcoming back my co-host. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> David Amos to the Real Python Podcast. Anything you want to say? <laughs> thanks. It's uh, it's good, good to be recognized, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been fun. I mean, it's over a year that we've been doing these PyCoders episodes and we got a bunch of really good stuff this week again. Yeah. I was able to play around with uh, my electronics a little bit more. We'll get into that a little bit later. So that's been fun. Nice. Well, I'm going to start off this week talking about the podcast itself. The first guest was Gerana Yella. He was on episode one and then came back when we talked about Python 3.9 and the release there. But he's uh, had an article in the works for quite a while. It's titled The Walrus Operator, Python 3.8 Assignment Expressions. And we've talked about the walrus operator probably several times on the show up to this point. But I, what I wanted to do briefly is just, I think sometimes terminology is always one of these barriers for people. <laughs> and the name really explains what's happening with it yeah. better than anything. And so I wanted to start out three terms I want to get out of the way. The first is, what is a statement? Mm -hmm. And a statement is really just sort of a unit of code, this like chunk of code that we've talked about parsing and how these things go through looking at the language itself and the peg parser and stuff like that. So like we can think of statements as like these individual units of code and that term just gets thrown around a lot. And I think it's a little confusing because it's very generic <laughs> as far as the programming goes, but what is an assignment? Yeah. In the Python docs, it says assignment statements are used to bind or rebind names to values and modify the attributes or items of mutable objects. So the idea is that when you say X equals 42, you're assigning that value and X now has that value assigned to it. And what's interesting is nothing really returns out of that or anything's, you know, kind of happening with it. It's basically just sort of binding the values together. And then there's some confusion, you know, sometimes with the idea that you could say, well, X now equals, you know, or Y equals X. And now they kind of pointed the same thing and there's some interesting stuff there, but. So what's an expression? In that case, it's a sequence or combination of values, or variables, or operators, and function calls that produce or return a value. Yeah. So expressions are kind of the funkiest one to kind of describe because if you were in a REPL and you had done that assignment earlier of like X equals Y, 
if you simply typed X, that technically is an expression because it would actually return something. It would return the value that, that X is assigned to. In this case, it would show, you know, what it is. More commonly, expressions are things like comparison or, uh, you know, doing things like equal to or, or greater than or equal to or something like that. But it also could be if you have seen like something like a, like a while statement, it could be just something that is standalone being evaluated and this idea of like truthy or falsy. So you could evaluate and say while X, you know, and as long as the value isn't zero, you know, it's some truthy value, then this thing's going to happen or, you know, none or some other kind of falsy thing. So expressions are kind of interesting to think about. So then if you tie the two together and you say an assignment expression, it's doing two things then. Yeah. There's the assignment where you're saying this value, in this case, the the symbol is a colon and an equals. And hence the weird symbology is then kind of the idea of like it's a walrus on its side with its tusks, right? Yeah. In that case, you're going ahead and assigning that value to let's say X colon equals something. And again, it could be uh, just a value or it could be you're evaluating something in that process too. And so what happens that's unique there is it's not just assigning that value to it. It's also returning this expression. As I look at this, is that true or is it false or, you know, it's, it's or returning a particular value. And so it, it is kind of a unique thing and it isn't in a lot, you know, all languages and it was very controversial <laughs> to add it to Python. Yeah. And we don't have to rehash that whole story, but I think it's a really cool thing and there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with it. I think there's value in it. And I think the hardest part is like almost like F strings, like where should I use these and where shouldn't I use these and, and things like that, where these things get added to the language and, and then, you know, there's compatibility issues. Like, I was just working with the Raspberry Pi and it's basically operating at Python 3.7. And <laughs> that's the you know version of Linux and Python that's kind of coming with it. And this is a, a feature of Python 3.8. And Garana wrote a whole article about cool new features in Python 3.8. And then I did a course on that. And so there's some material out there where we're just talking about kind of the fundamentals of like, you know, what assignment expressions are and how to use that Walrus operator. But what he's done here is gone much deeper in very Garana style um, <laughs> and talks about lots of different interesting uses and lots of new examples he's added. There's a really great example of like debugging. Yeah. And the idea that as you're going through a fairly complex calculation, as you're moving along, you can sort of set values to variables as you're evaluating them. And then that value is assigned. And so that variable can be reused later in the same you know, definition. It's harder to explain beyond the initial stuff I tried earlier here, of explaining the idea of the differences between assignments and expressions and statements. But the article really gives you a good experience of like, okay, let's walk through lots of examples. And I don't know, there must be like six or seven of them in it going through them. And then also like, how you could have done it, and then this is how this maybe makes this better. But he also does cover the reverse, talks about like where this is really probably not appropriate to use. One example I remember from an early episode of the show, I had Brett Slatkin on the show, and we were talking about his book, and he had used this new walrus operator to do sort of a switch case matching style and i think now with structural pattern matching in 310 that that will probably be you know the the more preferred way because it has a lot more structures and yeah actual um things in it to work with it but i think if you want to get a handle on what's happening with assignment expressions and dive into them this is a really great article and it goes it goes kind of meta <laughs> he's got another example that i think is funny you know, here we are talking on the podcast about an article where he's talking about the podcast <laughs> and using it as an example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of funny and meta, so recursion or something. <laughs> but he's like doing this whole thing where you're like reading a feed of articles and you're pulling out specific values from that. One nice thing that you can do with it is not have to redo calculations, say within the body of a function or something like that. You could, he's doing one where 
it's doing a line reading from a file to determine the line count, the word count, and the character count. But instead of having to recalculate each one of those as you've gone along or potentially read the file again, it, he's able to save those and evaluate as, as it goes along. And I like that example. There's some examples with list comprehensions. So yeah, it's a really thorough article and I think you can get a lot out of it. Yeah, I really thought that he did a good job with the examples because one of the downsides, I think, in a lot of articles I've seen about the walrus operator or these assign really, I, I, I mean, the walrus operator is a cool name, but I really do think that like probably we need to think of like assignment expressions because it's so much more descriptive. Yeah. You know, a lot of things I've seen in other articles about assignment expressions and even in the uh, PEP that originally proposed them, you see some examples of like, it showing you how it works. Right. But they're not always the most compelling examples because it's sort of like, okay, well, I can do that with it, but I could also do that this other way and it feels much more Pythonic and much more easy to understand. And it's also something that like, if more people are going to be comfortable with because they may have never even heard of this new thing. So the examples that Garana gives, I feel like do a good job of not only showing how the assignment expressions work, yeah. but also compelling examples where you look at it and you go, oh yeah, okay, that actually does make a little bit more sense. And yeah, speed things up potentially. Right, yeah. Or like you were saying about things being Pythonic and writing, like make it more obvious what's happening with the code. Right. Like in the case of, like he was talking about list comprehensions and sometimes you might go ahead and break that into a for loop. But if there are, Lots of lines, it's very easy for your brain to start to drift and go, wait, what did we do six lines ago? Right. And here you could kind of see it all in one line. And the idea that the it's ex, you know, this expressions being evaluated is very interesting and in that it actually returns a value itself is interesting, you know, like along with the assignment. So there's a lot going on in there. And you're right. Like I think I, I you know, I've said this joke before about async IO, where all the examples are just We'll, we'll just make it sleep, you know, <laughs> that will, so that async and await, this is, we'll just wait for something to sleep. And I'm like, well, right. that's really a very fictitious thing. I mean, yes, you, you would do that. And we're going to talk about that more today, but you know, in general, like you are probably going to await something actually happening, you know, beyond right. just yeah. uh, time wait. So what's your first one? So mine comes from the Replit blog. And if you're not familiar with uh, Replit, it's, it's like an online coding framework where basically it's not just for Python. They've got a bunch of different languages where you can get access to like an online interpreter. And they've even got like a, an IDE within the web browser and some hosting services so you can host apps on it and everything. So you can do like all your coding on in the browser through them. And they support Python and JavaScript and I think Ruby on Rails and like or I guess just Ruby. Ruby on Rails is what, like the web framework? I don't I don't know. But they support a whole bunch of different languages. But they released a new web framework that is really kind of a Flask extension. So they have a Python package. Hmm. You can pip install Repolit. And in that Python package, they've added a couple of new modules. One is the DB module and one is the web module or at least I, I believe DP is also new. I know for, for a fact the web module is uh, is the new one. But the, they wrote an article announcing this. And if you have a little Flask app and you want to connect it to a database and also do some like user authentication and host it somewhere, they have this example that is, I'm, I'm kind of eyeballing this. I think it's like 11 lines of code. <laughs> and it has a like a, a route, like an index, you know, homepage, basically. And you have to be logged in to see that route. So in this 11 lines of code, you create the Flask app, you create the route, you make sure that the user is authenticated, and you also run the web app on Repolit, like hosted. Huh. And so it it allows you to very quickly, like, I think, you know, when you run this, you then you'll get like a URL, basically, that uh, says, hey, you know, go to this URL, and you can see your app running. And it's it's really an amazingly quick way to get 
something up so that you can show it to somebody. And I know, you know, there's other ways to do this that are, that are popular, but just look like, you know, if, if you work a lot with Flask and like Flask and, and, and maybe want to do some like prototyping just to like show maybe you're a freelancer and just want to show a client or you just want to, you know, show it to your colleagues or, or it's just a, a like a profile project that you're putting together and, and want to like be able to show it to maybe you're going to a job interview and you want to like have it up and running so that they can, uh, they can actually look at it. Yeah. Then you can, I mean, it's just amazingly fast and you don't have to do any of the configuration of the database. You don't have to do any, anything with like the authentication uh, and all of that. It's just all baked into it. And yeah, it's, it's a really neat little project that they, they put together and uh, like I said, this 11 line code example that they have here, this little Flask app that, you know, is connected to a database, has the authentication and can run it, but also, uh, you know, have it running on, you know, hosted somewhere where you can then share that URL is just kind of mind blowing. Yeah. And, totally. uh, and really, really <laughs> cool. So it's a short little article. It's just, uh, you know, it really just demonstrating like the things you can you can do with it. There's documentation that goes into a lot more detail and there's more than, you know, what is just in this article. But I think, you know, if you take one look at it, you'll have maybe the same kind of reaction I did where I just was like, that is, that just is really cool. So yeah, I I thought that was really a neat idea that they had. Yeah. It's cool to see more of these things where, you know, you could be running your code online and they have like a nice little pre-plan where you can kind of dabble with it quite a bit. But yeah, anything to be able to show your work, you know, very often you're not going to go to an interview and say, well, let me borrow your computer here and uh, <laughs> I can show you some things or whatever. You can just direct them to like web examples is really fantastic. We've talked about that multiple times. Yeah. I want to take a second and talk about virtual office spaces. You know, most people use a combination of Zoom and Slack or Teams to meet with people online. But one of our sponsors, Gather, has made it a lot more organic. They have these little 8-bit spaces where you walk around with your arrow keys and your video turns on when you get close to someone else. So you actually feel like you're walking around an office and bumping into coworkers. And it's free for your first 25 users if you go to gather.town slash real python. That's gather, G-A-T-H-E-R dot town, T-O-W-N slash real python. So my next one is a Reddit thread and it's titled, do coders really learn how to use entire libraries just from the documentation, (laughs) (laughs) which is a long title, but I I think it really is a good question Yeah, as being, you know, members of RealPython, we are very much involved in, you know, tutorials and, and video courses and now a podcast that has, you know, varying levels of instruction depending on, you know, the kinds of things that we're diving into. I always feel like it's always going to be a mix of things. Yeah. We've talked about taking tutorials and going a little further with them, like maybe trying to work ahead of them or reading all of it and trying to do it on your own or coming back and kind of modifying them. But I don't know if we've dived too deep into just pure documentation. And I guess my biggest problem with documentation is it really, really varies. Yeah. The episode last week where I was talking to Josh Simmons about open source, you know, a lot of developers do not have the resources to, or the bandwidth or, or maybe even the, the skill set to create compelling, you know, super instructional documentation. And, you know, that's a challenge. And so, yeah. I think for certain libraries, you're going to maybe need some help from outside of it. I think that it's a sliding scale as you increase, you know, your, your knowledge and your comfortability with the language itself, reading the documentation will definitely work. It's, it's similar to what we were saying about like going on, reading the code itself, you know, from the libraries on GitHub, which I think is still really a a powerful thing, but there are going to be things for a beginner or intermediate person that are going to be sharp edges where they may not make as much sense. And I think documentation hopefully can cross over that. And, you know, the thread is really 
long. There's a lot of people commenting on it. Yeah. And there's a lot of varied backgrounds. And I think it comes across pretty well. Like of of all the threads I've read lately online, it's very, very positive, which I thought was good. Yeah. There, there wasn't really a whole lot of negativity happening there. There are a lot of good ideas of like ways to approach documentation. You know, there's nobody throwing any particular thing under the bus saying, you know, this is not a good way or doesn't work or whatever. And it's really going to vary, I think, on the person. But I think this might be a good resource just to kind of look through and, and think about. And, you know, there's not too many specific documentation examples that they're throwing out, but more like personal experience and techniques that other people have used um, throughout the thread. Yeah. And there's like follow-up questions that other people have that they're posting like, okay, well, I mean, how do I even know that a package exists in the first place? Like, yeah, you know, what, true. and, uh, you know, and you, there's some people like, well, I mean, you know, you Google or you use the, the PyPI search, you know, things like that. And, and you, you do research. I think that that is something that I didn't really like when I was brand new to coding, Yeah, especially with languages that actually had third party ecosystems, which is, I guess, most pack, most uh, languages these days. But I never thought about like how much research would go into like picking a package that you you would use. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's you know, it, it varies. And, it, you know, some packages have really, really great documentation. But it, it also kind of helps to sort of, I, I think, define like what documentation actually is like, there's so many things that can be considered documentation. True. And in a lot of ways, tutorials fall under the umbrella of documentation. A tutorial is showing you how to, you know, I think if you, most open source packages uh, and even closed source, you know, where you get like a manual when you, uh, when you purchase it or something, there's going to be some sort of like quick start guide where it's just, it's going to at least show you like, here's how you kind of get up and running with it. Yeah, hopefully. One would hope. Yeah. So tutorials sort of, they're a type of documentation that are meant to like walk you through something like this is it's, you know, how you do something. And, uh, and then you have like more of the reference, you know, like an API reference or something that's just like, here's all the modules and all the packages in this. And here's all the functions and classes and everything that's inside of this and like what they do and, you know, what their interface is and that kind of stuff. But even that isn't, the complete story because there are implementation details that don't work their way into that. Right. And every now and then those implementation details affect you as a user. Like maybe the way something was implemented uh, is causing some sort of bottleneck for you. And like the only way to find that out is to actually go and read the source code and try to understand like, what is it actually doing and how is it doing it? And uh, is that, you know, is that where some sort of performance bottleneck or memory bottleneck or something is is going on so it's not always the most fun thing to have to do is to you know go to the reference or actually dig through the the source code but uh it it just is a reality that at some point you might have to uh might have to do that but I, i guess to sort of add my personal experience on it is i enjoy tutorials and i enjoy videos and you know if if I find a package that's like, huh, this looks like it might work. This is interesting. You know, I, I usually start with whatever the homepage for it is on PyPI and see if there's either docs there or a link to the docs. Do they have a quick start guide? Yeah. You know, try to like, you know, go through that, just get an idea, maybe sort of browse like what the different inside of like the API reference, like what are the different things inside of here? Like just not reading it, necessarily but just seeing like oh they have a function called this maybe it does right this thing that i that i might need or you know those kinds of things that once over is so powerful you know like just to get an idea of like the scope of what what this thing can do and that's also part of that deciding process like am i going to use this thing right does it does it look like it's in the right shape for this problem <laughs> right you know and then like can i can i go to you know google and and find some tutorials that someone's written on it? Or can I go to, you know, YouTube or something and search and see if there's like a video of someone actually building something with this? And can I just kind of use that to get a sense for like, oh, okay, here's what it actually looks like, or, you know, right. or, oh, they ran into this issue with it. And you can kind of like, it's all just part of that research process that you end up having, having to do. So 
I would say personally, no, I don't learn entire libraries just from the documentation. It's a mix of lots of different things. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a mix for me too. Like I'm, I'm a fan of tutorials and, and video stuff. Very often it, it can feel like it's slowing you down depending on what's going on there. But I am a huge fan of documentation that has quick start guides or yeah. even as you dive into the more technical part of like, you know, like an API reference that shows more examples like that is the biggest thing for me is like, okay, you can define that to me, but like, if you can show me the chunk of code where it's being implemented and, and the kinds of arguments that make sense going into it, that's, you know, huge uh, for me as I'm going into that. And yeah. I think the term that uh, Josh used is a, he's in documentation being this sort of force multiplier as far as like, you know, making your package be useful and then also like approachable and popular, you know, there's a lot of things that can go in there. And so that, I think that's why a lot of people say that it's a great place for people to start. Yeah. If you're thinking about contributing, you know, with different projects and stuff like that, you know, just even giving those examples or those quick start guides and are, are such big changes that help out the package beyond just, you know, actual code implementation. Yeah, for sure. So what do you got next? Next one I've got is another real Python one. This one's actually a video course from uh, Martin Broyce called Using Sleep to Code a Python Uptime Bot. And so we were talking a little bit about sleep earlier and how you don't like seeing that in the async tutorials and things like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird thing to await for always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get that, you know, it's like a placeholder or whatever. Yeah. This dives into like a much more practical use case for sleep, somewhere it would actually show up in real code and not just as like a placeholder for something that's doing something. So the point of this is building a Python uptime bot. So basically a bot that is going to send a a web request to an application running on the internet and and just, you know, seeing like, hey, am I getting a healthy status from that? Is it still running or does it look like there's, there's an issue? And the reason you're using the sleep is to like control how often you're actually sending out that that request and pinging yeah. uh, the server, or I guess not really pinging the server. You're actually sending a request somewhere to uh, to an actual web page or you know some part of the app. It gets into things like using timeit to measure the code's execution time and uh, and things like that. Like uh, maybe how long did it actually take to get a response? How many times did you have to send it before you got anything or you know things like that so yeah it's uh it's it's really nice just to see a real use case for this and because i think you know the sleep function which by the way is in the time module yeah uh, in the in the standard library so it's you know time dot sleep if you want to use this you import time and call it that way but it's one of those things that i think can sometimes feel like why is this in here like when am i ever going to actually uh, use this it just seems like yeah. You know, but then most programming languages that I've worked with, actually, I think 100% of them have some kind of you know this functionality. So yeah, that tells you that okay, there's a there's a reason that <laughs> that it exists, and sometimes you just need to control timing a little bit. So this gives you that that ability. It is a video course, which means that it is not on sort of the free side of real Python. You can watch the first two lessons yep. for free. You don't have to be a member to watch the first two lessons, but if you want access to the rest of the course, then you do have to have a real Python membership. So it's something to to keep in mind. But but yeah, good course. I like it. The thing you're mentioning there that like, well, why does a language need this kind of thing? Um, but there's all kinds of things, as much as I was joking about async await, as far as like a tutorial thing, but there are states where you need to pause to make sure something happens. Yes, absolutely. And in other languages, I remember doing strange things like, all right, do some math. That'll take some time. <laughs> you know, like kind of like <laughs> creating some kind of thing where like, you know, like, okay, divide this by this and that or whatever. You know, some kind of like thing that like, okay, that took like two seconds. Okay, that that's my, my little wait state. So this is, you know, a dedicated thing where you actually are putting a value in and and what's noticeable and interesting about the course is he does do a thing with the time it, as you mentioned, and I didn't know some of the defaults that he mentions. And 
uh, it's a little dangerous if you use some of the default settings there as far as like how long it, how, or how many times it'll run. <laughs> oh, yes. And so it's yeah. like, yeah, it's like, oh, 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 that's going to run a million times. Oh, that is a lot of seconds. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, you have to be, uh, you may want to change the default settings there for, for something like time it. Right. Yeah. And, and this uptime bot idea is a really cool sort of like web friendly and beginner friendly idea. But I have, the very first like professional programming job that I ever got, it wasn't actually with Python. It was using Lua, another nice little little language. And it was with an audiovisual uh, installation company. And I was programming interfaces for people to interact with these these systems. These were like, you know, not like concert halls and things like that. This was, you know, we did, you know, hospitals and schools and conference rooms and all sorts of stuff. And, and we found our, ourselves in situations where they, they wanted, you know, wanted us to interact with various systems throughout their facility. And so I was, you know, doing all sorts of things like communicating with video projectors and communicating with speaker amplifiers and all sorts of of stuff, uh, lighting controllers and, and things like that. Yeah. And one of the things that I found myself having to do a lot was allowing people to, you know, non-technical people to set up like lighting scenes or something like that. And you'd want like, you know, they'd be able to do it and then say, I want to switch a scene in, I want this to run for like three minutes and then switch to another scene or, you know, they could sort of control all that. And so, you know, that's another application of sleep there as, uh, providing some sort of like countdown or just like, I'm going to set this timer, basically, you know, sleep for so long. And when it's done, then I know I, it's like time to go to another state somewhere else or things like that. So there's all sorts of, you know, real world use cases for this kind of thing. Absolutely. I mean, you think about automation and there's uh, tons of those kinds of things where you're going to want to do that. Yeah. So it makes sense. Yeah. And that actually brings me (laughs) to my next one, which is kind of a project but also uh, actually interesting set of articles and i'll be adding some extra resources um but this is something you had in pycoders that i was like oh i'm totally interested in that (laughs) (laughs) yeah and the title is monitor your home's temperature and humidity with raspberry pies and uh, that's plural and prometheus yeah it's by chris collins on a a site called opensource.com chris collins uh, he lives in hawaii which is interesting because you know i had just you know, moved from there. And he was talking about wanting to measure the temperature in his home and the humidity. An interesting thing about Hawaii, maybe, maybe a lot of people don't know, but the majority of the houses are single wall construction and people keep cool by just leaving their windows open all the time with these sort of jowl you see windows that, you know, kind of yeah. adjust. You might've seen something like that in Florida before or whatever. And yeah, that's how we would stay cool. Most of the time is rare to have air conditioning, but one of the things that you could add to your home to help in more summer months or when there is no wind, which is really what you're counting on, uh, is to install like sort of an attic fan type of system that can pull the warm air out of your house and and sort of push it into the attic and and so forth. And yeah, we were on the verge of getting one ourselves. (laughs) That was eyeballing them at Costco (laughs) at the time, but he wanted to be able to measure the differences of, of that. And so that's where he got very interested in this. And he is setting up like three of these raspberry Pi. I think there's zeros, the, the very small, yeah, I think, I think uh, that's right. Sort of very headless (laughs) versions of the raspberry Pi. It's like just a card looking kind of thing. And then the sensors, which are, uh, you know, the technical specification is a DHT22. Now I've got a Raspberry Pi 400, which we had talked about in a previous show. I went out and finally got one, <laughs> which is very cool. I like the keyboard and the mouse. Actually, I got the package with the mouse and everything, and it's a nice little package. And so I started updating it, getting it all set up, and then I got this breakout cable for it that plugs in, and basically I can set it up on a breadboard. And then the big trick was I needed to get some of these DHT22 sensors, and I sort of ordered the wrong one. I didn't read ahead. (laughs) There's a version of it that has like a little board on it that you may want that adds a resistor that kind of goes between the sensor and the the positive source coming in. So whatever, I had to go dig out a resistor, which I I have a lot of those. So anyway, I had to do this on on a little circuit board, a breadboard. Yeah. So I ended up kind of going backwards a little into his articles. His first article on open source 
actually was a little more about you know set up temperature sensors in your home with a Raspberry Pi. And so I was able to complete that and kind of get through it. I had a little bit of a headache with some library stuff, kind of going back to our previous conversation we just had, <laughs> in that I had to find some documentation and the library is sort of changing. It, the example one is using this Adafruit DHT library and I was having trouble really getting it to behave the way I wanted. And so I found an Adafruit circuit Python DHT and Adafruit really is transitioning everything over to circuit Python. And I have a conversation coming up soon with Scott Shawcroft and we'll talk about that. Nice. In order for circuit Python to run on a raspberry Pi, it has a, a layer, this thing called Blinka. And so, you know, some extra little things to kind of get all that set up. So I, I ended up doing those steps. So those kind of are outside the, this article, but I think maybe with a Raspberry Pi Zero, you might be able to go straight through the article and, and the examples, and it might work out a little bit better. I was more excited about using the Raspberry Pi 400 and connecting to a monitor and getting a code <laughs> yeah. editor set up and all those kind of things. And then I was going to do lots of experiments with this breadboard thing. So I was kind of approaching it differently. And so I think that's where my divergence happened. Right. But anyway, I was able to get it going and, you know, basically use the simple idea of like, okay, well, I don't want it to just spray out like humidity and temperature data as fast as it can. So I, I put a weight state in there of, you know, put sleep and said, okay, like, okay, just initially here, let's do this every five seconds and kind of measure what's going on. And it, it worked great. I was like kind of shocked the, the circuit Python library with this Adafruit DHT library does all the heavy lifting. It, yeah. You literally are just creating an object, um, you know, called sensor. And then you're uh, in my particular case, the circuit Python one, you, you literally can say the sensor name dot temperature or dot humidity and it spits out the values for you whereas the other library requires a, a thing where it does like a read sensor uh, method call and then you tell it the things you want to have it come out and what pin you want it to come from and it kind of comes back as a tuple but i i think it's a really neat thing and it's such a common project that people are interested in doing you know not only for you know people <laughs> who are living in hawaii or whatever and needing to check their their uh humidity i'm interested because um it's so dry here that was like a shock yeah uh moving to colorado springs from hawaii <laughs> yeah we bought a uh some of these humidifiers and uh, i bought a very simple like kind of atomizing style one and those are okay but the ones that seem to work better are a little bit more in they kind of feel like a swamp cooler having lived in arizona or like you have a big water filter and it wicks the the moisture into the air from it and and i was wondering like okay well how much humidity is this generating without buying like a you know hygrometer or whatever it is called yeah to 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 do that i was like oh i could do this and then i also want to kind of see what the temperatures are throughout throughout the day you know in the summer here so anyway it's a fun project and then the part that i guess i haven't spoken about is this prometheus i didn't get a chance to play with it as much but the idea is this prometheus library can be set up in something like a docker container and then the sensor on your raspberry pi connecting to your say wi-fi in in your home can be sending out these values sort of logging them and then the prometheus server if you will this 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 Docker container that's set up can gather them. And then it's very easy and I haven't done it quite yet, but like based on what I'm seeing there to turn that into like a, a bit of a dashboard and do actual reporting on it. Right. So that's my next step, but it's really well written. He provides the resources I need to needed to go out and find these extra little steps to kind of mess with. And so if you're interested in this, I think it's a neat way to kind of dive into it and you're learning a lot about not only the electronics part but you know setting up the raspberry pi and then now also like logging and and uh gathering that data with a with a separate system so if you're interested in doing some kind of monitoring with um small electronic devices in your home and using python this is a neat set of articles for you yeah for sure i like at the end of the article there's a little uh section I think it's something like do citizen science. <laughs> yeah. And it's got like a little, little collection of, of articles. You mentioned one, like setting up, I think like the temperature sensor on a raspberry Pi, but there's a couple other little articles there too. It kind of falls into this whole category of like, yeah, citizen scientists 
projects and things like that. So, so there's a bunch of other topics to explore on, on opensource.com with, uh, under that kind of label. Which yeah. Is pretty neat. It's very cool. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's about a topic we cover this week, and it's titled Using Sleep to Code a Python Uptime Bot. The course is based on a real Python article by former guest Mike Driscoll, and former guest Martin Broyce is your instructor, and he takes you through the basics of time.sleep, how to use timeit.timeit to measure your code's execution time, and then how to use time.sleep to build an uptime bot to make sure your website is still up and running. He also takes you through a couple steps to refactor the code to add error checking and more. I think it's a worthy investment of your time, no pun intended, to learn a simple way to pause your code and build a useful small project. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections and include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. So what do you got next? Next one I got comes from uh, Brett Cannon, who was um, has been on the podcast before, right? Yep. Yeah. And Brett put out an article called What to Do When You Botch a Release on PyPI. And I like that the article is called When You Botch a Release and not <laughs> What to Do If You Botch a Release. Yeah, true. Yeah. Because in my experience... The first time you release something on PyPI, you'll probably botch it. Um, <laughs> uh, or at least I did, and I know other people that have have done as well. It's going to happen at some point. Sure. The, it kind of starts out, you know, like, you know, so you've you made a release on PyPI and there's a mistake. And in parentheses, he says, we've all been there. And uh, maybe it's like a huge mistake, like, you know, the whole release was bad. Or maybe it's just like you made kind of a dumb spelling mistake in the readme that you're kind of embarrassed about. And you want to go, you want to go fix it. Right. And he talks about ways that you can, you can do that. So I won't go, you know, into all the detail. It's not a very long article, but it, there was a couple of things that I learned that I, I didn't know about until I, I read this. But one thing that I had heard about before, and he talks about here, is if your entire release is bad. I mean, it's just like, oh, oh no, this is like this was a mistake. I, I don't want people <laughs> using this. Like, what do you what do you do? There's no way to like delete. So, I mean, I guess you can delete things uh, or delete like your entire thing, but that's not really the right way to do it. What you can do is something called yanking the release, hmm. and what that does is tells PyPI not to list that version and tells PIP not to even consider it when trying to like resolve, you know, versions and dependencies and things like that. So, so it effectively hides it from any new installations and, you know, it, it makes it unavailable. And that's really the right way to do it so that, you know, because maybe it's actually working for someone, they've got it installed. And so you don't want to like just totally break things or, you know, it really just gives you the right option for basically hiding it so that you know no one else can can install this i think like unlisting it kind of yeah thing. it's sort of unlisting it the, so the reason that you know it won't break anything for people that are using it is that if you explicitly ask for those files then you can still get them hmm. so it's not like totally unavailable but it's like if there's someone out there using it and they need it you're not gonna like ruin their their day because you've you've deleted it and uh, it's no longer available. Okay. But if someone is doing a new installation uh, or searching on PyPI for for things, it's just not going to show up. It's it's effectively hidden. And then if there's a, a non-code problem, so this kind of goes to the you know fixing like a spelling mistake in in the README. What I did not know about was that the the version specifier spec says that you can actually end a version number with a dot .post component to tell installers like pip that you don't need to upgrade a package with the same non-post version but if it's a new install you want to get the latest post release version so if you have like a a version 1.2.3 of something and you're like oh i i you know misspelled a maintainer's name on it and i want to make sure i get that you know in the readme or the whatever and i want to make sure i get that right or you put the wrong email address or something along those lines, then you can fix it and release 1.2.3.post1. And any new installations will get that post1 version that has everything fixed, and it'll have you know that in there. But you don't need to up, update 
the version number because it's not a semantic change. Like you haven't, the code stays exactly the same. So effectively, there's no difference between the 1.2.3.post1 and the original 1.2.3, right? Like it, it, the, it, the code is 100% exactly the same. So uh, so this just is telling Pip to like, hey, if there is a newer post version, you know, get that because it'll have some little fixes in it or whatever. And then he talks about what to do if a wheel file wasn't compiled properly and using things like build numbers and sort of how Pip actually works with wheels. The wheel is like what you actually download when you're, when you're um, installing something with, with PIP and then that gets you know used to install it. So if there was a compilation mistake there or something got corrupted or something along those lines to where like you can't install it or there's some issue with that, then again, the code doesn't need to change, right? So you don't need a new version of the code. You need to fix the wheel so that it can be installed or something like that. So you can provide a build number and uh, that will like shadow the old wheel file. So Pip will always make sure that it's getting the latest, you know, highest build number. And uh, that's all you need to do is just upload that new wheel and then you're good to go. But that sort of leads to this issue of uh, what he says, you know, repeatability is not reproducibility. So even if you pin your versions where you're saying, hey, I want to get exactly this version of some package if they've uploaded a new wheel, then you may not get the same wheel that you got last time mm. when you installed it. And if they weren't responsible with that wheel, then it may not work exactly at the same time as it. So it's not, so just pinning your dependencies does not guarantee any kind of reproducibility, which is an interesting thing to think about. It leans toward it, but is not a guarantee in a lot of ways. It's not a guarantee. Yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, kind of an interesting thing to think about. And then he talks about, you know, how to support like pre-release and brand new versions of Python and things like that in your uh, in your project. So anyway, it's got, you know, just a ton of really great information. And if, if you are a package maintainer and you have a package on PyPI, this is something I would just have bookmarked. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. On like, you know, quick access to like, like, uh, whoops. Okay. Um, what do I do? Oh, yeah. Go to this article. It probably has my you know, my case covered and I can figure out what, uh, what I need to do here. So definitely good stuff worth, worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. What a great resource. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very handy. So thanks, Brett. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Brett. So I have a separate project in the project section here beyond the, the other one I was messing with earlier. Yeah. And this one's pretty quick. Um, for those of you who are fans of the settlers of Catan, I'm guessing that's how it's pronounced, or Catan, depending on how you want to spell it, C-A-T-A-N. I've heard it both ways. Yeah, I have too. It's a, you know, it's a board game. I, I really like this kind of game yeah. where you're having a conversation and it goes a little bit beyond just the dice rolls because usually it involves like trading and strategy and stuff like that. And um, there's some interesting things happening there. But this developer, and his name is Brian... Colazzo, kind of in a similar way to Nier Ades, who I had on the show, who was talking about this idea of deep reinforcement learning and having like AI play a game to kind of learn how to play the game. He has created this implementation of Catan and that's very fast. <laughs> he calls it Fast Settlers of Catan Python implementation with a and a strong AI player. Yeah. And his goal of the project is he wants to find, okay, what is the strongest settlers of Catan bot that possible? And he has different variables that you can kind of set inside that. This was a pretty easy project for me to stand up um, comparatively to some things I've had to play with lately. In this case, I was able to pretty much just stand up the Docker containers that are involved in it. It is using a few JavaScript libraries to give you a visual representation and you could try to play along with it, but it is not super geared toward human interaction. Yeah. Partly just the controls are, are, are a bit limited. Um, like I never found a, a place to do trading um, or um, things beyond just rolling the dice and buying cards and roads and other things like that. It's a little, little harder in that sense, but it is really cool to watch it play <laughs> itself in you know, these different yeah. versions of the bots and play against each other. And then he has some additions to the library where it can collect the data and then do comparison and do some 
machine learning behind that. And it's a neat project. I'm, I'm you know, not only because it's an f- interesting game to to see like implemented and then like how could you, you know, have bots play it. But it's a, it's just well done. I was surprised. Like I'm wondering if he had done the graphical yeah. uh, implementations for the the different types of uh, resources that are on the cards, and or if that was something that was already existing. But it's something to check out, especially if you're interested in that idea of uh, reinforcement learning and you know training AI and and or maybe just Catan. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. I I I thought it was a really good sort of example project of of how you might go about doing something like that. It looked like it was also very well, very well organized. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, a good project to just kind of read through and, uh, and see like how they're actually doing those things. So, yep. I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah. So what's your project? Project I've got is, uh, also another Brett Cannon creation. All right. Yeah. This one I was really excited about when I saw him announce this on Twitter a few weeks ago. And, I was really excited about this, especially when I started reading like what actually he was he was doing with it. So if you've ever used Python on Windows, which I suspect a lot of people had, yeah. you might be familiar with something called the Python launcher, which is a uh, the the py py command. I don't see this talked about a whole lot in tutorials that I've read. And I know even on real Python, we haven't really mentioned this a whole lot. I did an update a while ago on the our installation guide for Python, and I, I made sure to mention it there just because it's a really handy way to work with Python on Windows. And it's a really nice idea. So you've got your, you know, you can have multiple Python versions installed, and you want to be able to work with those sort of all under one interface. And it fixes this problem of like, when I type the command Python into my terminal, yeah, which Python should it use? Like, where is where is it supposed to look? And that can be a, an extremely frustrating thing for beginners that end up having multiple versions installed. And you know, on Windows, it doesn't come with Python pre-installed, so it's not as big of an issue, I think, for beginners there than it is on something like if you're if you're running a, a like a Linux distribution or if you're on Mac OS where you've got a pre-existing Python version that's like the system is dependent on. Yeah. So Brett took this Python launcher idea and has created one for Unix. So this will work on any Unix-based platforms. And it's the same kind of idea. So you've got this py command, the py command, and you can use that to specify like, hey, I want to use this version for this, or you know, it'll, it will also default to whatever the, the highest version of Python that's installed on the system is or latest version, I should say, maybe not the highest is the right word, but latest version of Python. Uh, but you can also like specify like exactly which one you want to use. One thing that's really cool about it, though, is that it integrates really nicely with virtual environments. So you can use it to create a virtual environment. And then if you're in a folder or subfolder of something that has a virtual environment installed, then all you have to do is type the py command, and it will activate that virtual environment if it's not already activated and make sure to use that version of of python that's there so if you're working on a project you just you know change dire- change directories into that project and then the py command just works the way it's supposed to if you have a virtual environment already uh set up there you don't even have to activate it and uh, and so i thought that was really a neat feature for it as well and he's got any you know, instructions on you know how to install it on all sorts of different uh, flavors of Linux on Mac OS. There's a a homebrew, I forget what they call them, it's not a cask or whatever. There's a you know you can install it with homebrew. It works with Apple Silicon, so if you're on the new M1 processors, it it works there. And he's got uh, if if you if you don't find your specific flavor of Linux or operating system on here, and you know your operating system supports Rust, then there's a way to install it on any OS that uh, that supports Rust. And he's got a nice diagram. Uh, I guess I should mention, first of all, that the Python launcher was actually written primarily in Rust, not in Python. That's what he's used to, uh, to write it. But He's got a really nice visual on the GitHub README, and uh, I imagine also in the in the documentation for this, a really nice little visual of like how this command is actually resolving which version of Python to use. 
So if you study this a little bit, you'll be able to sort of have a mental model of like, what is going to happen when I, when I type the pi command in and like, where is it going to actually look up everything? So that's super handy. Overall, yeah, just I think a really exciting project. One thing he does mention though is that, you know, it's not a goal of this project to become like the way to launch the Python interpreter all the time. Sure. It's really just a handy tool to use. You know, he says on here, if you know the exact interpreter you want to launch, then you, sh- you should do that directly. And the same goes for when you have requirements on the type of interpreter you want. It's really, he says, you know, the Python launcher should be viewed as a tool of convenience and not a necessity. But still, really cool project because I really thought that the Python launcher on Windows was a really, really good idea. And it's, it's cool to see that being brought over to other, other platforms. Yeah, I'm interested in, in setting this up because through experiments and tutorials and all these different kind of <laughs> explorations I'm going through, I have lots of installations of, yeah. of Python and trying to stay on top of it. And so I think this would be a, a useful way to kind of maybe manage some of that. I've tried to use some other tools and um, I'm thinking this might actually be, after initial setup, a fairly lightweight way to kind of go between them. Yeah, I, for sure. I mean, I played around with it a little bit and it works beautifully on everything I I tried. I think that uh, this will probably end up, you know, working its way into my day-to-day routine. Yeah, cool. Honestly, yeah. Hey, uh, co-host, um, <laughs> where, where can people uh, uh, get in touch with you if, if they're interested? Where can they get in touch with me? Probably the best way is on Twitter. Okay. That is, my my handle is... Uh, kind of a funny word. It's so Mac Devad, but it's David C. Amos backwards, which is which is my name. Uh, so yeah, Twitter's a good way. You know, my DMs are open, and you can also just at me if you want to uh, say something. But I would say that's probably the best way to to find me. Yeah, cool. I, I've never mentioned it before on here too, but you can follow me on Twitter also. It's uh, Digi Glean, so D I G I G L E A N. You can always follow Real Python and all the things happening through real python at, at real python on twitter also thanks for coming on the show again and uh absolutely and co-hosting in the the podcast with me <laughs> yeah and uh we'll talk to you soon sounds good see you later all right bye don't forget you can make your own virtual office at gather.town slash real python that's gather.town slash real python I want to thank David Amos for joining me again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.